talk will be uh, completely different from the uh, two <coughs> before, which is probably good or not. You, it's about you to judge. Um, the point is, I will talk about uh, this robot here that we built in the lab, uh, which is um, the endpoint of a long series of robots, not only uh, humanoids, but also leg and wheel robots and so on. And we did not build the robot um, for helping man. So it's not a cleaning or an application driven robot, but it's a research tool. So we built the robot to address philosophical questions. What is intelligence? And how can it arise? And of course, intelligence is not a line. You cannot say this is more intelligent than the other one. I mean, even psychologists, as dumb as they are, I mean, I, I studied psychology myself, did a diploma, so I can say that. Uh, even they are aware that it's a multi-dimensional thing. I mean, there's creativity, there's logical thinking, reasoning, there's abstract imagination, and so on. So you cannot say this guy is smarter than that guy. So this can only be on a very thin dimension, but let's switch on to creativity or something else, and then it's vice versa. So this more intelligent does not work. So mathematicians say it, it, there's no order on intelligence. It's just different, right? Uh, just to address this. And one insight also is you need a body to be intelligent. I mean, all these uh, web crawling algorithms, they don't know what they are talking of or what data they are filtering. Of course, you can argue against this, but this is my, uh, from my experience, this is my uh, deep insight, my, my belief. Um, that you explore the world and you need to be able to, in a meaningful way, interact with the world and then you can understand uh, how to purposeful uh, pursue a goal within the world and then later on you can maybe go uh, in, on, into the internet and do something there but uh, I don't believe that you can build an algorithm just by dragging out information from the internet, who can get bright, right? But this can be argued uh, later on. So what were the uh, driving forces? How did we arrive at this um, robot, Myon, here? And I will not, in this uh, talk, uh, address um, art and science. I mean, we are doing a lot of projects. This has been a theater play at the Komische Oper in, in Berlin. Uh, three-hour piece which did address many many of those topics uh, philosophical issues which were then discussed also with the audience I mean um, it's it's always for scientists I feel like uh, important to exhibit uh, their results and make this accessible to a broader audience um, depending on time so I guess I have half an hour this is three parts. If I su succeed to be quick, we will get through all of them. If not, I think I will at least uh, be able to go through the first two. Uh, the design request. I mean, before you build something, you have to analyze what is it built for. I mean, it's 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 been it's been built to be a tool for research within a, uh, a team which will use the robot. You have to list what's important to you before you build something. And there are six points. The first thing is availability. So I've seen many research groups where you have one very expensive robot, like a six-digit number, I mean 100,000 euros or more, and this is the one robot. And then you have like 20 guys or maybe eight or 10, but there's one robot. And so this is like a neo... <laughs> it's, it's not me, sorry. This is like a needle hole, a peephole, uh, so you do want to have a possibility to maybe uh, have more robots because they're cheaper or to uh, just use parts of them, right? So this is one thing you want to address. Maybe if it would be possible to have this guy using just the arm and this one the head and then later you put it together, this is the way to go. Third, second thing, flexibility. I mean, I've seen there's uh, many robots like the... Um, uh, ICAP or 
Georgia Meta, a European research group that you may have heard of, and they are making a big money with the European uh, Commission and the research projects by selling, building, and maintaining those robots. But uh, guys who start to address their research issues with that robot need at least half a year, or maybe meanwhile, th three months to get started. So the goal here is, if you have a researcher coming over, maybe it can be boiled down to one day so that you can soon start with your experimentation before you get uh, acquainted with the hardware. And this is one thing. And simplicity is also uh, going the same direction. I mean, if you have to read many manuals and set up the machine and so on, it's just getting in the way of gaining an insight. Adaptivity is clear. Um, so maybe there's new sensors or there's new, new things uh, Let's say somebody wants to study odors or um, haptics, so you may want to change the platform. This is an issue you need to address. Then transparency, while well, this is actually a point uh, which is always overlooked, I don't know why, um, you actually have one attentional focus. And if the robot is here, you can either watch the robot or you can watch the screen with data on it. Once you look there, I mean, this is about how we work, and if we want to get an insight, this needs to be in one focal place. So uh, what's taking place with that robot is that you don't need a machine, but the robot itself is the thing where it takes place. If the robot is doing something, the robot could say, or there's many LEDs on the robot where things can light up, so you want to have the visual and auditive information of what's going on inside the robot while you <laughs> interact directly with the robot. Uh, also, sometimes it happens that they just get lost in uh, <coughs> watching the, the curves at the screen and uh, then the, the robot uh, falls over and gets broken and so on. So there's many issues why you don't want to have this. And last but not least, affordability. I mean, the point is you rather have uh, cheap robots if they break or you have many of them and not only one which is uh, ridiculous expensive. From that, uh, one conclusion is that you want to have it modular and in a threefold way um, <clears throat> it should be also autonomous and the threefold way means uh, if somebody uses just an arm or a leg of the robot it should be with a known energy supply it should have the computational power it needs to be driven and of course <clears throat> uh, you should then be able to plug it together uh, we also drive the robot by neural networks, by the way. Um, so if you have it apart or plugged together, the topology of the control system of the neural network should be able to deal with that. I mean, if you know insects, uh, some insects really can have their limbs moving if they are detached from the body, and if they with the body, then it's also working. Of course, for an insect, it's only a one-way thing to uh, detach and then uh, it with some insects, it does regrow. Uh, I will go. I will not go into detail. So this uh, modular paradigm we also used inside the modules. So there is only one type of actuator of motor, and then we are using just one or five or more for the same joint. So instead of having huge motors for where huge forces are and small motors for the fingers, we just use one type of motor and use one or five or so and mix them, right? So this is also uh, principles that, that we're using. And of course, you have an ease of maintenance and you can redesign things, for example, in the first time we had the grippers like that. And meanwhile, this is really with soft uh, rubber material so the robot can point and grip, uh, grasp things. And uh, the parallel research work in the group is possible. I mean, if you enter our lab, you find a torso with a head and a right arm for hand-eye coordination. You find maybe some guy only having one leg. You find one with a torso and two legs doing walking or stabilization experimentations and so on. We are also using the robot in lecturing and so students can get um, used to the robot with small parts of it and then go on with the whole platform. And of course, there's completely new kinds of experimentation 
possible, you can use an arm and attach it where the head normally is. So you can play around with the morphology and of course the body morphology plays an important role, I would say, as much as algorithms or other things we have heard of. But the shape and the, the abilities of the body of the robot, they, um, they uh, also shape the kind of intelligence which is needed. Here you see it with the, shell, with the shells and without. So the one who have seen uh, Hugo Cabrera yesterday night, um, we did not copy from a movie, but it's just a light white uh, construction, so this is aluminum, very thin, bent in a way that its stabilization, uh, the stabilization is maximum. And there's also many, many parts, actually everything that's right in here, uh, of pr printed um, plastic, so that's uh, 3D printing, rapid prototyping. And we are using not, it not only as a mock-up, but as you see also, there's ropes uh, and wires going here, so this is really uh, huge forces, so this is a kind of learning how to build those that they do not break. Right? Okay, so the multi-actuated joints uh, have two advantages. First of all, uh, there is only one actuator, so we can go down with the cost by using only one type, so we buy a few hundred of the same type instead of three big one and four smaller one and so on. And you can also have antagonistic uh, control things like uh, antagonist and, 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 and muscle in that and in the other direction. And there's a short video demonstrating this. So one joint is driven by three motors. They can also can go in different directions. And here you see one very early experimentation where one leg is doing a, a walking motion and then uh, you get it later on a guy goes on with <clears throat> Here it's with shells, a torso, two arms and two legs. Could be that the video is not that dark here. You see it in a smoother way. Um, so there is no central intelligence. We don't have a central processor, but it's many, many, and the neural network is distributed all over the body. And later on you will see a single leg, which will do fancy things only with the network which is inside the leg. Um, here, that's the properties um, of the robot. And as you see, you have more motors than degrees of freedom. This is due to the many motors go to one joint. And many, many sensors, a lot of energy, which is distributed also in all modules. We have uh, battery packs. And uh, you see the mass with 15 kilograms, including batteries and shells, is very, very lightweight. I think actually, uh, a boy size 1 meter 25 uh, is heavier than this robot. Okay, now for the morphological layout, there's also many issues. I will, there I will just highlight the, uh, the process how we got from the sketches to, um, to the final product. So, if you have something which should be the center of your research, you want to have something that you like to work with, right? I mean, if you, have, if you have a coffee machine and the coffee tastes disgusting, you will not use it. So, I mean, you have rather have a product which is beloved by the team working with the robot, right? Otherwise, it's, it's, it's I mean, a lost effort. So, we uh, work together with Fracken Paul Pulheim, which, which is a, a product design company on you know, a professional level and they did workshops with that with us so they prepared many many they did a huge research on robots from uh, cartoons movies and so on you name it uh, they have all been categorized so we put them up in a XY screen here's a, a zoom in on that so the, the character of the robot is important, and if you go into machine, human-machine interaction, then you would like to have something that goes with the expectations of the human part, so that you can focus on the interaction which is natural. So, foolish or clever, friendly or bad, is one of these uh, X, Y matrices that you need to decide upon. And here is a more uh, s 
scribbling, more yeah. drafting, uh, character development. And then what we did is that we just asked the team. So everybody had a few dots and could then just have three points glued to somewhere. And then we found what the team would like to work with and ended up, then you already see it, with something which is uh, young and maybe a bit foolish. So some like a child exploring the world, but not something you need to be uh, afraid of. And these are the sketches then. There were two design lines, uh, which then eventually evolved into those two uh, first sketches. And then there were um, mood boards. I mean, uh, there's many different lines out of design. You know the, uh, Google, the iPhone, where is it? Somewhere over here. So Apple products should be, or maybe I'm here. Here, here, you see it. And here you have a crisscross between straight lines and round elements. And then eventually there were Modo and Muyo. Um, and it ended up, so these were processes where the team went through, it ended up with that intermediate design, which already looks a bit like the, um, like the final product. The point is that, uh, I think it's a bit stretched here, the image could be that's copied from a 16 to 9 presentation. Um, designer always tend to have everything locked up, so there's no hole and nothing in it. And of course, this is nonsense. There's a lot of heat produced by the motors and so on. And so uh, we had a lot of discussions saying, well, this is not going to work, right? Um, and then they opened up. So in the final product, we have here uh, openings. And then they just went with that and said, well, why not uh, also have the audience look into the robot? because also we want to see what's going on there for maintenance, for plugging cables, and also see the LEDs if there's something highlighting. Um, <clears throat> so that was the next step, already with the openings. And as you, I mean, we have been exhibiting this robot over years, and children, like three or four years, they're just running to the robot and start to interact. So this design approach really uh, fulfilled what we wanted to have, but as you see, it's not human at all. I mean, it has two arms and two legs, but the head is more like from a reptile. You see, I mean, this um, this shape is like the eye of a, a crocodile or something, or of a frog. But anyway, people feel like it's human, so it's not really you need to copy. I mean, the um, uh, there's some Japanese researcher who do this in a perfect way. Ishiguro, of course, yes, Hiroshi. But um, it's not important for an, for a meaningful interaction. I mean, this is why cartoon uh, characters do work. Um, especially children are able to abstract this, so it's about the interaction and not about copying the things. So that's now the, uh, the final product as of today. Uh, you see, for example, uh, I, I was talking about redesign. There is now a new um, hand which can point and grasp and so on. And this is actually uh, has been shot in, in, in Berlin City Cube. And let's see, so how many minutes do I have left over? Like five or something or ten? You say? You name it? Rather, rather ten than five. Okay, good. So I'm not in a hurry. Um, now, as for the behavioral aesthetics, <clears throat> of course, we this was not the first machine that we were talking of and uh, built in the lab. Uh, there, a lot of um, expertise and knowledge went into that, and one, of course, was the control loops and the things that we feel like um, are the basic building blocks of intelligence or of intelligent behavior. To be more precise, we actually focus on body control 
but not in a way that is normally done. Normally you have a model of the robot. Of course, it's easy. If you build something, you know the masses and the lengths and everything. But uh, babies, which are newborn, they do not come with a blueprint or with a, uh, with a plan, and they do not build a model by investigating this, but it's, of course, by interaction and try and error. And so we, we have a bunch of principles which are very, very easy uh, to implement, and also I mean, could, could write it down if somebody is interested in a technical sense. Um, the point is, the difference from the normal paradigm is that we do not use sensors. I mean, although we have many sensors, we build this principle also only with a battery and a motor, not even with a microcontroller, but you can have a simple electronics. And this is showing a very interesting lifelike behavior that if you exhibit this um, and let people interact, say, well, this is trying to avoid me or do so they, I mean, of course, this happens all the time. Um, it does not mean that it's like that, but I just show you and then you, you judge by yourself. So the, um, the, the main loop that we're using is the so-called cognitive sensor motor loop. Of course, there's applications on that. So if you do want to have the maths, you can have it, uh, but it's explained actually in that way this principle goes against external forces. I mean, not using a force sensor or a touch sensor or everything. Um, it's just using the motor as a motor and as a sensor at the same time. We are not uh, using a current measurement or so, but it's... Okay, I, I do not go into detail here. The point is, uh, you can build this with uh, very, very few electronics. And uh, this is a Lego motor, and you see there is only one the normal motor cable going out there. And this pendulum, so this is real time, it's not slowed down, is going up and finding the opposite of the gravitational force, which is here the, uh, of course, the effective force. And you could tilt this and then it would go upright again. But one interesting finding is, of course, if you now use this aluminum rod, you have a touch sensor as well. I mean, you cannot, Think about it, you cannot touch something without not applying a force on it. And of course this force is fully sufficient to lead this to the other way around and so on. And the advantage is uh, clear. Uh, normally engineers are educated that way to say, oh, if you want to have uh, a haptic interaction, you need to detect touch and then for that you need to touch sensors. And there's European projects where millions of euros went into to design this artificial skin, which is then put upon here, and you have many wires and a signal processing and so on. But if you cut this off, of course the functionality is lost. But here, you can easily cut this off here, and the remaining system still has the ability to interact with this touch. So one thing that we need to readdress really on a daily basis is to train ourselves not to think complex and to think in modes like touch sensor we need uh, or detecting touch we need a touch sensor and so on I, I would have more examples on that um, it does work so the very same principle from the Lego motor without any change is put here on this leg uh, of the robot Mayon without shells here uh, only on the knee and you see what happens is already a playful interaction. Of course, also the leg tries to go upright, but cannot succeed. It will fall over at some point. And from there, you have an interaction with the real world. I mean, there's a gravitation, there's maybe the trembling of the, uh, of the colleague who is holding this. And now if you use the more sensors, then you can get by this interaction insights on your surroundings and on your own body shape. And we will now see in the next video this very principle put upon all three joints. We have here the knee joint. Now here you see it's going upright again, right? You have the knee joint, you have the ankle, and you have the hip. And there is no, I say this before I show the video, there will be no communication between uh, those three things. I mean, um, you could build this, or we have built this with 
wood or plastic sticks and just having battery and motor here. And the, the only communication is through the uh, forces inside uh, the, uh, the material, the, the physical forces. And what happens is, so one, two, three is just switching on uh, the uh, energy supply. What happens then is that this lag will stand up. And this is not a planned trajectory, actually um, this is not even switched by force sensors or gyroscopes or acceleration sensors. You can build this easily with Lego motors and you can change the morphology of the robot and it will still go up, right? And also it does never stand completely still as we also don't. It's always seeing, oh, well, there's the gravitational force, so it came uh, going a bit backwards, and then you feel it in the back, so we go, go um, to the front again. So it's constantly uh, probing the environment and interacting with the gravitational force or with whatever force you apply. So there's a second solution, how you can defy gravity. You can go into this bridge-like uh, body situation. And you also see there's no start or no stop by playing, uh, pressing a button or switching something. It's all there, always in place. But if you would take this into outer space where there's no gravitation, the leg would just stop doing it. Okay? But of course, let's say you put this into garbage and throw something on it, what would the leg do? It would just get rid of that and then uh, establish itself on top of that. So crawling out of dust and standing up is also in there. You see here a huge potential of this principle, very minimalistic principle, that can only be tried out if you have a modular robot like this one. So it has been built to study and improve algorithms like that. You cannot do this with a centralized processor uh, robot which cannot be uh, used in parts. Right? And the standing of the robot uh, uses then two of those legs and if you use the arms, I mean this principle is very powerful it can be used to grasp things, to uh, stand or go down and so on. Okay, I think yes, well um, maybe I show another video I would be done here um, since we're going into the panel discussion anyway, I would maybe um, I mean I could now, I don't want to show a video now. I mean, let's, let's rather stay in the time. So maybe I take one or two questions before we do the panel, and that's it then. There's one. Yes, uh, okay, yeah. Uh, so I'm interested in, uh, to know uh, how this principle works a little bit more, because I, uh, I'm not quite sure. So you use like an uh, inverse pendulum, for the model of the no, upper position, or, or, uh, okay. okay do you want but um, what kind of sensors do you use? Okay, you can. It's about the implementation. You can implement it in many, many different ways uh, to to uh, get it to the point. Let's say you have a motor, and. <clears throat> You can read the voltage, which is proportional to the velocity, to the speed, and you can apply voltage, and then if there is no friction and no other weights outside, then it's also proportional, right? Okay, what you do is you quickly switch between, so this is a CMOS switch, and there you have an inverting integrator, and for the short period you sense the signal and for a longer period you drive it the reverse way and that's it. Okay. Is it uh, similar to your capacitive sensor? Uh, no, not really. What I mean, if you go into detail, this is actually like a control power supply, the back electric uh, motor force. And there's of course an inner resistance due to the winding. And so this here behaves actually like a negative resistance 
which is a bit more than the original resistance. Okay. Uh, you should not go too much into control theory. If you know PIE control or stuff like that, what you normally have is that you have a target value. Let's say you drive this. You say, I want the joint to be in that angle and to be in that position. All the other robots, they normally drive target positions and say, do this or do that. So the motors get commands what to do. And then there's a control loop. And then you normally have parameters which you tune, which you optimize, that you as quickly as possible get to your target value and then stay at this target value. And actually all the control theory is about removing those irritations, getting there quickly and stabilizing this. And what we are using here is actually exactly the opposite. So we are interested not in going to the final value, so, but we're interested in this transient part. If we are standing upright, it's getting boring, then we do something else. And it's not about getting up quickly and stabilizing this, it's about how do we get up. So if we have a leg with three joints or other complex morphologies, then you can easily see it will always go up. And there's no design that we put in there, but this is a very basic principle which really pursues that goal despite the morphology. And of course, you can put a bit of learning on top of that, and then you, you get where. And this is only one of the principles, so we have like uh, 12 or 10 principles which you could always put a phrase like go against the force, go with the force, uh, stay in motion, relax, and so on. And with just switching that, you can get the whole body controlled. And uh, this is completely different from control theory and completely different from having uh, driven joints with a model and with a computational brain somewhere. Now we okay, should now go, we are, okay. We should move on. Uh, you can talk to me during lunch break also. Yeah? There you go. Good. Thanks a lot. Give him a hand. Not an artificial one, but a real.